Hi, how are you? Good, I hope. Hope you're staying cool because it's really hot here in Oklahoma. It's like it's been over 100 degrees at the very least, up to 110 in some places. It'll wear you out here. It is everybody. <laughs> Makes you have brain glitches. Well, I've been uh, going through some old books that I've had for a long time. I used to think a lot about writing a book. I wanted to, but yet I really couldn't think of what I wanted to write about. So, <clears throat> my life got sidetracked in other things. But now after I've made some big experiences and learned some new things, uh, I think I'm ready to go back to it now. And I have some books on writing. And one of these books, that a lot, most of them are filled with all kinds of information that you would be startled to know and never heard about on the media or or in newspapers or anything else but here in uh, the aspects of composition it's a very interesting book and it is made by Billy Andrew Einman and Ruth Gardner and uh, I got to this one part on page 190. The name of it is Rules with Reasons, <clears throat> The Basis of Moral Education by Richard Peters. Number one, to the question. Why do problems of moral education loom so large nowadays? An obvious answer is that standards are no longer stable. A moral code cannot be taken for granted as it could, say, 50 years ago. Not that people now tend to fall short more frequently of the standards which they set themselves. Rather, there is much more dispute about what such standards should be. Older people are more often shocked, not because the young have no standards, but because they seem to have different ones. And number two is, there is something to this thesis, but not, I would suggest, quite as much as it is often claimed. Perhaps in more settled and stable times, parents were able to pass on a code, the details of which could be adequate to their children. When such conditions no longer obtained, after World War I, it is true that some of the younger generation did revolt on certain matters, proclaiming defiantly that morals were merely a matter of private feeling or of individual decision. But, but both their subjective stance and the reliance of the older generation on a tradition seem equally inadequate at this time. For on the one hand, it sounds pretty thin to suggest that telling lies and being cruel are wrong just because of one's private feelings or personal decisions. And on the other hand, established traditions palpably cannot deal adequately with such an issue as sexual morality. The task of this generation is to work out a morality that does justice both to the Victorian view and to the progressive protest against it. My present purpose is to mark out such a middle road. Number three, the first task is to identify what we are talking about when we speak of morals. What is a moral matter as distinct from a legal or religious one? The question is not as simple as it sounds. <clears throat> For moral rules cannot be identified simply by their content. Theft, murder, and incest, for instance, are against the law. They are also religious sins and defy custom, and they are thought immoral. On the other hand, there are some rules, like those against lying and the breaking of promises, that are generally matters of morality and matters of law only under very special circumstances. St 
Still other practices, like spitting, are highly indeterminate. It is, it, is it immoral to spit in the street? It is against the law in the subway, but in some homes it is quite customary when near a fire. What makes some say that it is an immoral practice and not just a filthy habit? What lies behind the conviction that some rules are matters of morality and others are not? Number four. <clears throat> it is surely the suggestion that reasons support such concepts as good, right, wrong, and ought, which gives them the status of moral rules. Such reasons mark out their importance. A rule is a rule of law. Roughly speaking, it has issued from a determinate source, such as a king, a parliament, or a judge. It may or may not be backed by what we would deem a sufficient reason or deal with a matter of moral importance. If, on the other hand, we call something like shaking hands a matter of custom, we suggest that there's no such determinate so source. Heaven knows where it came from, and there may or may not be some point to it. If we, we were to speak of it as a moral rule, however, that would imply a reason, however limited. Number five, to say that moral rules are those which have, have some backing and reasons does not, of course, go far enough, for reasons may be very peculiar. Imagine, for instance, a discussion about corporal punishment in which one person is against it because it gives rise to bruises. <coughs> what is wrong with a few bruises? asks the other. They turn blue, replies the opponent of such drastic measures, and are bounden duty is to minimize the amount of blueness in the world. It's such a horrible color. We would think <coughs> such a man morally mad even though he gave reasons for his policies. And this would be because his fundamental principle which made reasons relevant to him was minimize the blueness in the world instead of our commonly accepted principle of minimized suffering, which is the best point in my view. Number six, I've introduced this rather grotesque example merely to indicate the crucial point that fundamental principles are needed to make reasons rele relevant and to confer importance on the moral rules which they support. The task of the moral philosopher is to show why a principle such as minimize suffering is defensible, whereas a principle such as maximize suffering or minimizing blueness is not. I cannot pursue the crucial task of justifying fundamental principles <clears throat> any further in this article. I shall have to assume a general agreement that some fundamental principles, such as those of fairness, freedom, respect for persons, and the like, are justifiable, and that others are not. Such abstract, higher-order principles lie behind the conviction that matters like theft and the breaking of promises are wrong, and other things like holding a fork in the left hand rather than in the right <coughs> are merely conventions. When, too, we wonder about the morality of such acts as spitting or extramarital sex relations, we are looking at them through peepholes provided by such principles. The principles make us take account of some aspects of these practices rather than others. <coughs> Number seven. My example, too, brings out the further point that there are different levels of morality. <clears throat> a small number of fundamental higher order principles are appealed to for justification of other lower order moral rules, 
Our duty, for instance, to obey the government obviously derives from more abstract principles such as the protection of the general welfare. But these lower <coughs> order rules are not all of a piece. Some rules, like those relating to spitting, depend very much on time and place. Others, like those concerned with contracts or with non-injury to the person, are not as relative. Indeed, it is difficult to conceive of a society of men in which some such rules did not obtain. <clears throat> yes, there is moral purposes to have morals. <laughs> Number eight. This, I think, is where one of the widespread muddies about morality creeps in. People do not distinguish among the different types of rules within a moral system. They will think that because some rules, say about gambling or sex, are relative and depend very much on time, place, and circumstances, all moral rules are similar, similarly relative. In parts of Af Africa, it is said, Men are encouraged to have more than one wife. In Europe, only one. In the United States, only one at a time. Therefore, all morals as to marriage are relative. And fraud, murder, rape, and theft are then presumably just as culture-bound as spitting in the street. Number nine, it should not be thought either that any simple appeal to a lack of consensus about moral rules necessarily establishes anything of ultimate significance about their validity. If consensus were the acid test of validity, science would also be an insecure position where the scientific view of the world is accepted by only a minority of the human race. If there are good reasons for moral or scientific beliefs, the fact that many cannot grasp them is irrelevant. There are probably many in the Trobriand Islands or in England who cannot grasp Newton's laws in our estimate of their truth affected by this deficiency. Number 10. <clears throat> Those who attack absolute moral principles often develop another type of argument. They say that such principles cannot be absolute because there are circumstances in which they must be bent a, a bit. What about white lies? What about breaking up a promise to save someone's life? This is really a very feeble objection because most people who believe that there are fundamental principles of morality also claim that these principles are subject to and other things being equal clause. <clears throat> if there is more than one fundamental principle, it must sometimes be the case that there is a conflict of principle. A person must nevertheless act in such cases, and whatever he does, one of his principles is infringed. A white lie is not told out of inclination or for gain or glory. It is told when the truth might cause needless suffering. In such a case, other things are not equal. But because there are some cases where a principle must be infringed, nothing follows about the general duties involved. The general duty to tell the truth is not undermined by the fact that on rare occasions other duties are more urgent. Number 11. <clears throat> I have spent so much time on the refinements of morality before mentioning anything about moral education because I believe that efforts at moral education on the part of well-meaning parents and teachers are often hamstrung by confusions of the sort that I have indicated. The realization that some moral matters are far from straightforward leads to a generalized agnosticism about morality and to a lack of firmness in handing on rules to children. Children, it is proclaimed, must decide such issues for themselves. 
as if anyone, let alone a child, ever decided for himself that lying and cruelty are wrong. 12. Actually, a child is well along to maturity before he can assess the rules which structure his life, can work out a code of his own. This parallels the history of the race, for morality as a code distinct from religion, custom, and law took a very long time to emerge. A small child lacks the subtlety of discrimination required to distinguish matters of morality from matters of law and custom, let alone to decide for himself on his moral principles. <coughs> Excuse me. Thirteen. How can this, how then can this process get started? Obviously this child must learn to use concepts such as right, wrong, and ought. How can he do so except by being initiated into the code of a community, into a tradition? Much is picked up by imitation and identification, <coughs> especially in the sphere of attitudes to others. But morality is not a skill like swimming to be learned purely by imitation. It involves learning a whole family of concepts which cannot be acquired without a great deal of instruction and explanation. Parents often think that they are teaching children not to steal by scolding or punishing them when they take what belongs to somebody else. They do not ask themselves whether the child has yet the concept of property, of people having rights to things, and of distinctions like that between lending and giving. Without a grasp of this family of concepts, a child cannot properly understand what stealing is. Moral education must always take, a, take account of where children are, and that requires considerable imagination. Because of his limited conceptual apparatus, a child's actions look quite different to him and to the adults who are judging him. And that's true, and that's one of the things that I think about women having to work so long away from home and other people taking care of their children they're not teaching them their tradition or their morals because they are spending too much time with other people they're just different about their concepts of these things and they're not learning from their family they might learn from their community but hardly babysitters are there in the community but are scattered everywhere now, I think that's a big problem, too, in our society today. In 14, but learning to be moral is not just a matter of learning to apply concepts correctly to certain situations. It is also a matter of learning to behave consistently in the required way. Rules must regulate something, and what they regulate are human inclinations. Children must develop early the habit of regulating their inclinations. They will usually learn to do this gradually if there is a steady and predictable pressure from their parents for one of the most valid generalizations about human behavior is that people behave overwhelmingly in accordance with their understanding of what is expected and approved. That is why consistency on the part of parents is so important. If a child is brought up within a firm framework of rules and is consistently approved of when he conforms to them, he will gradually take the rules into his own mind. In this way, a firm basis of habits can be laid down. Without that start, a later development of an autonomous code is more most likely. For how can children learn to adopt rules of their own also learn to apply them intelligently to varying situations. If they have not learned from the inside what constitutes a moral rule. 15. Very young children do not properly understand moral concepts. And yes, there's some of us adults that don't understand, some of them do. By that I mean that though they can learn to regulate their inclinations with the consciousness that certain things are right and wrong, 
their grasp of the grounds for such judgment is very hazy. They regard rules, so Paget argues, as more or less transcendentally laid down. The notion of the validity of rules and that they are grounded in principles takes much longer to dawn, so it is pointless to expect very young children to do what they should because they see the reasons for it. That will come later as their understanding increases and their sympathies and loyalties begin to extend to their contemporaries. In the early stages they have to learn what to do what is right without properly understanding why. <coughs> and that makes it difficult to grow up learning all this extra stuff that's more complicated level by level to my understanding. <coughs> Number 16. Many readers may be shocked by such a suggestion. If so, it is perhaps because their view of learning is modeled too much on discovery methods in, say, mathematics, whereby children can be induced through appropriate questioning to grasp principles, to have insight, etc. That is one very important way of learning, but it obviously has little application to such things as mechanical skills or historical facts. The beginning of wisdom and understanding human learning is to realize that there are many ways of learning and many different types of things that have to be learned. And one of the palatable facts is that most things in life must be learned before they are properly understood. In any case, understanding is usually a matter of degree. Young children learn that bodies fall to the ground if you drop them, and they cannot possibly understand why. Indeed, how many educated adults can explain gravity? <coughs> In the learning of skills such as golf or cooking, great proficiency can be attained by a mixture of practice and imitation without the slightest understanding of the underlying principles. Morality is not just a body of beliefs, nor is it merely a system of skills, but it is like both in that during the early stages, traditions must be accepted on trust from those with more experience and wisdom. Trust is essential, for without that relationship between parent or teacher and child, the basic body of rules cannot be imparted with firmness and without fear. Number 17. What should form the content of a basic body of ethics? A basic body of rules to provide the substance of a tradition. It would obviously include either fundamental principles themselves, such as the consideration of people's interests, or such rules as those relating to respect for persons, for property, and for the keeping of contracts that fall under the fundamental principles. A few such rules can be insisted on without constantly correcting children over trivialities, many conscientious, conscientious parents seem to be to lack discrimination in this respect. <coughs> they, may, they make as much fuss over table manners and tidiness as they do over lying and stealing. If children are hemmed in by rules, they have trouble developing a sense of what is morally important and what is not. I often doubt that parents are clear about this themselves. That's true. Perhaps their parents didn't understand it either. I can they teach their kids to be friends that are any different than they are. And that's how things are handed down through generations, to my understanding. Number 18. Children vary greatly in the pace of their development, and no hard and fast rules can be laid down as to when the giving of reason will begin to bite on a child's behavior. The one thing is apparent. Reasons will be ineffective until the child's psychological development has reached the point where they awaken some response in him. A good reason for keeping a promise 
is the inconvenience caused to others if it is broken. But what does that mean to a boy who cares nothing about others? How can he even be moved by respect for persons if he has not gained the sympathy out of which such an attitude arises? How the psychological underpinning for morality emerges is a matter for psychologists, but I suspect that children largely learn to care if they are brought up by those whose own sympathy spreads like a contagion. 19. If all goes well as the child begins to develop interest, and companions outside the home, his capacity for moral reasoning will also develop. That is, if he is encouraged to discuss different points of view, in our highly differentiated society, he will find that he has much need for such capacity, because on many matters he will find that standards conflict. He may find, too, that social changes make some of his parents' views seem a bit old-fashioned, at least on matters that do not fall under basic moral rules. At that point, there is some justification for saying that he must decide for himself where he stands. He will, however, be able to do so only if his early training has given him the necessary equipment. It is most unlikely that he will find that his parents have been mistaken on basic rules such as those relating to injury to the person and to property and to the keeping of contracts. On more relative matters, such as thrift, business ethics, or sex relations, he may come to think that they are mistaken. It could be surprising nowadays if an adolescent of any spirit accepted all of his parents' standards, but at least he should learn to accept or reject elements in the tradition into which he has been initiated by seeing how they square with fundamental principles. A solid basis of rules has to be passed on in such a way that a sane and sensitive morality can grow out of it. Reason must have an inheritance of traditions to work upon. <coughs> Number 20. The view of morality I have here advanced assigns a crucial role to the authority of parents and teachers both in laying down a foundation of moral rules and encouraging children as they develop to strike out on their own. So I must end by saying a bit about authority, for I think that on this matter also there are many muddles. Our society has staged a successful revolt against the traditional concept of authority, which gave unlimited prerogatives to men over women, to parents over children, to employers over employees, but in overthrowing this patriarchal type of authority, we have tended to go too far, concluding that there is no place at all for authority, save, of course, in the sphere of law and state action. This all or none reaction overlooks the fact that in school and in school at home as well as in the state, there is a paramount need for authority. <clears throat> provided it is rationalized and carefully related to the tasks at hand and the individual's concerns. 21. <clears throat> authority is what bridges the gap between the generations for unless authority figures are identified and accepted, knowledge and skill can be handed on only by coercion or bribery. In the old days, children were often driven to learning things that were difficult. Progressive teachers in revolt against this approach appeal to the methods of the supermarket where a premium is placed on appetite. The treatment of children fell in with the tendency of modern industrial societies to gear everything to consumer wants. Progressive therapists tended to forget the extreme placidity of children's desires and the enormous part played by identification with others. This oversight is relevant both to the formation of wants and to the taking in of rules to control and channel them. Authority enters here as an intermediary between bribery and coercion. It should not be used, of course, to keep children in subservience, but to bring about identification with the elements of a society 
that must be transmitted. A child may become interested in learning something like metalwork because he admires his teacher. He may take into himself the code of a beloved parent. But unless he comes to sense what there is of value in the cherished pursuit, unless he comes to feel subjectively the rightness of a course of action, the teacher and parents have failed. Their task is to use their authority so that another generation will eventually grasp what there is of merit for itself in a style of life. They must work hard, in other words, to do themselves out of a job. <coughs> 22. As children get older, self-discipline should take the place of imposed discipline. Constraints become internalized and children begin to weigh from within the validity of their promptings. But their tendency to be self-critical, to develop a code of their own, depends on the extent to which they must have kept critical company. The dialogue within reflects the dialogue without. That is why discussion is so important during adolescence. Those in authority over children will therefore attempt to get children to do what is sensible by appealing to their common sense instead of ordering them around or appealing to their own status. They will not say, I'm your father and I'm telling you not to smoke, but will point out the dangers involved. It is a further question, however, whether a child's acceptance of good reasons should be the final criterion for his action. If a parent explains to a child why is it stupid and wrong to put objects on railroad lines and yet sees him doing so, will he stand aside and reflect that the boy is learning how to choose? Parents must weigh their own fundamental principles against what is instructive for their children. 23. <clears throat> Example, of course, is crucial. Parents and others must provide a pattern out of which the child can eventually develop his own style of self-regulation. This is not likely to happen unless exercise of authority is rationalized and sensitive, sensitively adapted to age, to persons, and to the tasks in hand. For the young will rightly rebel against the irrational expression of a traditional status. In brief, teachers and parents must learn to be in authority without being authoritarian. And after I read this, I found it to be <clears throat> a lot of uh, food for thought for my own personal relationship with kids and <coughs> and for writing about morals. For writers this would be quite a, a thing to think about if you're writing on the rules of moral. I don't see how you can be unbiased if you pick out the things that you see is right, if you're writing a, a public article about such a thing as morals. And I don't really remember reading any articles many, many years that, or if ever, about morals. So I may be writing about something like that too, but I still want to write a book. So I'll see if that happens, but I have other things to get done too. And going through my books is one of them. <laughs> well, maybe I got most of the stuff done outside so I can stay in here and get everything done like I need to do. And I suggest everybody stay cool. It is so hot out there. I'm waiting for some more coolness. Hoping and praying it comes soon. And I hope you all have a great day or a great night wherever you are. Bless y'all. See you later.